I'd like to start today by talking about something that we can really all relate to, regardless of who we are anywhere around the world, and that's life or death. So what do you think is causing 70% of death in the United States today? Would it help if I added that the same thing is going to cause 75% of deaths all around the world by 2020, just seven years from now? And what about that 80% of these deaths would be occurring in low- and middle-income countries? Now, the answer might surprise you a little bit. Chronic disease. The World Health Organization defines chronic disease as a disease of long duration and generally slow progression. So things like heart disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer, even more and more today, HIV AIDS. I have to admit that when I started working in global health, I thought that these were really mostly diseases of affluence, things that affected people in wealthier countries. Having studied development here at SIPA, I really didn't think I'd end up working for an organization focused on chronic diseases. But think back to what I said just a moment ago. In seven years, 75% of the world's population will die from chronic disease and that 80% of these deaths are going to happen in low- and middle-income countries. So by and large, the poor are going to be disproportionately affected. And what is causing chronic disease? It's actually really simple. It's everyday behaviors like how we eat, how much we exercise, if we take our medications correctly. And if behaviors have a lot to do with it, let's pause for a moment and dig a, deep, a, dig a bit deeper. We all know that behaviors are contagious. We know that social networks are a really effective mechanism for spreading information, right? Songs become infectious. Who hasn't seen the, seen the famous Gangnam video? Um, fashion trends dictate how we dress. I think it's safe to say we probably all own a pair of blue jeans. But research is also showing that negative behavior spread through social networks. So smoking, alcoholism, violence, even overeating and obesity are seen to spread through people's social networks. How many of us have kids, or haven't we all heard our parents say, if everyone was going to jump off a cliff, would you? Well, it turns out that if your friends and family were jumping off a cliff, you'd probably be pretty likely to jump too. So if we know that disease is infectious and unhealthy behavior spread through social networks, maybe there's an opportunity here. How can we harness this phenomenon for health? Could positive, healthy behaviors also become contagious? At Microclinic International, we're finding that actually, yes, health can be contagious. Throughout all of our projects around the world, from Sub-Saharan Africa to the Middle East to here at home in the United States and Appalachia and even in India, we're seeing that using a really simple microclinic model, health can become contagious. Now, a microclinic is not a little building. It's simply a group of people comprised of close friends and family members who come together to manage a disease. So microclinics are built on social relationships and social capital, not bricks and mortar. So they actually put the power of health in the hands of people themselves. Let's talk about how this works. So here we have one node within a larger network, and basically that's how we start. Imagine that each person is symbolized by one of these green dots behind me. And we start with just one patient. We ask them to recruit a group of their friends and family members, forming a little microclinic group. And that group engages with a nurse or a community health worker over a period of time where they receive access to education, basic technology, but most importantly, where their social support that already exists around them is fostered. And slowly, over time, these groups share with their friends and family members the information that they're learning and the healthy behaviors that they're adapting. And eventually, these behaviors spread throughout an entire community, changing health outcomes. So we typically have in our current health system today, we have the model where the patient is going back and forth to the healthcare provider, doctor, hospital, or clinic, as you see on the top of the screen. What we're suggesting here is to change that. 
instead of having one sick person going to see a doctor when they're unhealthy, we're having them engage on the right-hand side of the screen with their friends and family or their community. So if a diabetic needs to eat differently every night at dinner, who better to go over this information with than with their spouse or their family members that they actually have dinner? If an HIV AIDS positive person needs to take a strict medication regimen, who better to go over the regimen with than the person who's at home when they're taking the pills? What we're suggesting here is to take this health information and share it not just with one patient, but with their friends and family members, their peers, their communities, so that the information spreads and the behaviors become contagious throughout a community. So it's not just the scale of chronic disease that's important to consider. It's actually the cost as well. Diabetes alone, which is just one type of chronic disease, that costs about $500 billion a year, according to the International Diabetes Federation. Heart disease, $863 billion, according to the Harvard School of Public Health and the World Economic Forum. If these trends continue, by the year 2030, non-communicable chronic diseases are going to cost the world $47 trillion. That's three times the GDP of the United States of America. With the problem of this scale and this cost, we need a solution that's going to have huge impact and that will go to scale. We need to do something that anyone can be a part of. And our research is showing just this. In our project in Jordan, where we work with the Ministry of Health and the Royal Health Awareness Society, uh, the project is focused on diabetes. We found that more than two years after participants finished their microclinic program, they were able to maintain a reduction in HbA1c or blood sugar levels. It's pretty significant because most health programs after you finish, usually just a few months out and people either regress to their original state or oftentimes worse off than when they started. Let's go across the world to our project in Kentucky, which is located in southeast Kentucky in the Appalachian Mountains of Bell County. Um, this project is focused on heart disease, diabetes, diabetes, and obesity. And here our research is showing through a randomized controlled trial that 97% of participants have been improving in at least one health indicator for heart disease or obesity back across the world to Kenya, where our project is focused on HIV AIDS on Mpangano Island in Lake Victoria. Here we're seeing that preliminary results are showing that there have been no new infections of HIV among the cohort of people who participated in the program. This is huge. Scientists believe that this island may be the location on the planet with the highest rates of HIV. I want to pause for just a moment and share with you a little bit about the stories behind the data or the, the, the people behind all of these numbers. This picture was taken just this past June when I was in Kenya. You see behind me a community health worker who's teaching a couple of groups of microclinic uh, participants. This session was on nutrition and HIV. Now, at the end of the session, uh, the participants turned and said it asked if they could share a couple of stories about how the program was impacting them. I listened as I as I listened, I heard stories of how people were saying, you know, for the first time I actually know a few simple things that I can do to deal with this, that I can implement in my life to manage this disease, either for myself or my friend or family member who I know who has HIV. I was touched that they were sharing these stories with me, and I thought maybe they, were, they wanted to share because I was a visitor coming in um, to meet with them. But a few months later, some of our Kenyan staff on the ground sent me an email and said, at the last microclinic session, which was their kind of graduation session, 86% of the participants chose to voluntarily disclose their HIV status in front of their community. So think about if you had an STD. Would you feel comfortable to stand up in front of your friends or your family or your peers and share with them that you had an STD? The taboo on this island for HIV is far greater than what we can imagine for having an STD, most likely from which we won't die from. 
for people to be able to stand up and share with their community and their peers what they're going through is an incredibly important first step to changing this epidemic. When I was, uh, before I came to SIPA actually, the summer before, I was in India in uh, Gadag, northwest Karnataka and in southern India. And the project there was sort of my, my first adventure in, in global health. Um, I wasn't sure if, when I was in India, if diabetes would, was actually really an important thing to deal with in the developing context. Um, this picture here was taken at a microclinic session with a village elder in the red and some of her microclinic members and they're listening to a team of nursing students who are doing a diabetes skit um, on, on just live different management strategies for diabetes. After the session there was a young man who came up to me and asked me if I'd come with him to meet his dad. I said sure and we went over to the local hospital. I saw an old gentleman sitting on white hospital sheets in a metal frame bed and the young man explained to me that his father was losing his eyesight. He was actually very close to being blind. He also explained to me that his father was going to have a, his foot amputated in a couple of days. These were all the results of untreated diabetes. The guy said, you know, I can't believe that having come to the microclinic session, this doesn't have to happen to me or most importantly to my kids. It's not that hard. We can actually do things to change this so that none of us have to end up in the situation my dad is in right now. I think that what we're seeing with the microclinic model is its universality. We're seeing that it can be implemented across the world in three continents, across half a dozen languages, customs, cultures, religions, local diets, different contexts. And with an epidemic of such a monumental proportion that we're facing in chronic disease, we really need a solution that can go to scale and that can do something new. We can't just be building hospitals and training doctors. I think we need a solution that really anyone can be a part of, regardless of their country, their class, or their context. I'd like to, I, I think here, um, a point that a way to really sum this up well is that the 13th century Persian poet Sadi, when he wrote, we are all the limbs of each other, having been created of one essence. When the calamity of time affects one, the others cannot remain unaffected. So who would be in your microclinic?